Let's kindly bow our heads and let us pray. Father in heaven, we bless your name this moment. The Bible says where two or more are gathered in your name, you are in their midst. We are more than two. We are more than three. With the eye of faith, we see you in this auditorium. And across the world, as audience are watching via the internet, please, let this evening be unique. Speak to us at the point of our needs. Take me out of flesh and put me in the spirit. Please, not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, and exalted. Not I, but Christ. Be seen, be known, and be heard. Not I, but Christ. In every look and action, not I, but Christ. In every thought and word, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I changed the caption just a few minutes to the session. So if there is any change in the uh, already dispatched flyer, uh, our subject today, the part two of yesterday's session is yesterday we dealt with faulty family foundations. Whom shall I marry? The part two ought to give us a solution. So I title it Fixing Flawed Family Foundation, subheading Traits of the Right Spouse. Traits of the Right Spouse. Anybody who wants to marry, you are looking for practical characteristics of a good spouse. We are about to have a long night today. As I always do, it was Jesus himself who said, if you continue in my words, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You can say an amen out there. That's a weak one. You can say a hearty amen out there. I make to you four promises. Promise number one is the Bible is going to be the bedrock of our study. The reason is the Bible means what it says and says just what it means. Promise number two, you are going to be enlightened irrespective of who you are. Promise number three, you are going to be challenged to make the most important decision of your life. And promise number four, your life and mine, our lives will never be the same. I want to give a brief announcement. This coming Saturday, we are going to have baptism. And any individual, men, women, boys and girls, as we study, we come to a certain conclusion and realization. There is a deficiency of spiritual health and intentionality. So God will be calling out on individuals, including on Saturday morning, for them to give their lives to be baptized and recommit to the Lord. Tomorrow morning and every other morning, 8 a.m. Kenya time, I will be leading out in a basic Bible devotional and a prayer session. Every day of the year, I will be leading it out by the grace of God together with our team. Hear me. One of the dysfunctionality of the families, many families do not have a pattern of a devotional life. So we saw it as a need every day, 8 a.m. East African time to 8.30 East African time. We avail ourselves, we study the Bible briefly, then we pick up the lessons, then we spend time to pray, and it's becoming a growing community. We call it Uplift Your Morning. I invite every audience, every listener, anybody joining across the world to be part of same. Lastly, if you intend to be part of the master class, that is going to deal, in fact, for the married couples, we call it Love Connect. It's a one-year mentorship and masterclass on the concept of what we are attempting to do here. It's 2% of the detailed content, how to fix a dysfunctional home, 
Ladies and gentlemen, there is no... Let's not pretend there are crises. There are practical, biblical, and also professional ways of dealing with it, including mentoring children, raising the next generation, fixing a dysfunctional home, and for we call that love connect for couples. And those who are not married, we call it not yet tied. Your knot is not yet tied. You are not yet hooked up and married, and we will be willing. And we are hoping that by the grace of God, people will transition from not, not yet tied to the platform of what we call the Love Connect. Anybody interested, uh, the, the crew who have the details, they can post it out there and we'll reach out to us. So I ask the camera crew or the online folks to fix that as well. I had a lot of calls and a lot of personal messages yesterday night and throughout the day. Uh, quite a hundred number of young people, you reach out to me uh, through my social media handle and I gave you God-based, God-centered answers. Some of the answers are going to come, as I told a couple of you during this session. As we open the pages of God's Word, I pray that God will speak to us. Yesterday, I set out three key objectives to provoke us to rethink, analyze our misguided concept about dating, courting, and marriage, while we instead welcome God's uh, uh, welcome and follow God's impeccable ideal on the subject matter. Number two, to unequivocally present some practical qualities to seek in a prospective spouse. This will be answered today. And lastly, to ignite a passionate discussion that says, among others, that quest to be in a relationship without a clear destination is the highest form of mediocrity if not a denial of faith. Fixing flawed family foundations, traits of the right spouse. I dedicate this to Susan, that when Susan is grown and a generation of head caliber, they will understand the Bible has offered quality, irrefutable counsels on this very slippery area where the world is not sure what to even do and what to even say. May I begin by saying, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Countless millions of shattered families began with wrong dating habits. Let it sink in. The first difficulty of the family, in many cases, started with the wrong foundation on which the dating started. Hence, I said, fixing flawed family foundations. And the subheading, traits of the right spouse. So while family have started with shattered families, started on wrong dating habits, Many arguably, ladies and gentlemen, do not understand the purpose of dating and courtship. And I dare say marriage, but yesterday we gave a framework for say. The question must be asked, what is it? And are there right and wrong people to date? Absolutely yes. How can you know the difference? This is why we are here today. After today, if you date wrongly, you caught wrongly. You are on your own. You are not a victim. You are an accomplice in frustrating your own life and disturbing your own future. I want to make a bold statement that it is time for this generation to unlearn the wrong principles acquired from society and to learn and apply God's true principle that will lead to happy marriages, that will lead to fruitful marriages, that will lead to established marriages, that will lead to sustainable marriages, if you permit. Everyone is fussy about the cozy, the mundane, yet the excessively obnoxious marriage or wedding bliss. And young people are blinded. They are dreaming 
of their night. It is my day. And it ends up in tears. Allow me to say tonight, dating has not a distinctive biblical precedent. If you study the Bible, no, there is nothing called dating. You can't get it. But since the purpose of dating or courtship is to prepare for marriage, we can learn a lot about dating by knowing God's ideal concerning marriage. Our failure to descend worldly, non-biblical approach of dating results in the countless heartache, heart pain, and broken homes. There is the need to reteach young people a new way to date, emphasizing biblical principles concerning marriage. It is interesting to state that our dating system as we have it today does not biblically prepare young people and women for marriage. The modern dating system does not train young people to form relationship. Rather, it trains young people to form a series of relationships and further trains them to harden themselves to the breakup of all but the current one. So they break up, they form relationship, and they are excited. I've dumped him, I've dumped her. And it is a module that is being run today. Even if there is a form of sanity, this system only prepares young people for divorce. So we want to do a historical analysis of the dating concept. Dating was invented within the last 200 years or so. Dating arose out of romanticism, which emphasized, among others, is a philosophical underpinning that thinks about passion rather than logic. Follow me carefully. Dating started about at least about 200 years ago. During the last 200 years, dating is framed on a philosophical underpinning called romanticism, which says, don't think, just act. Don't reason, don't be logical. Be sporadic and spontaneous. If you study carefully the literature, I will tell you, writers such as Rossio lamented that Western civilization had fallen into error of exalting reason about feeling. This was the argument. Why is the world thinking instead of just acting? So based on this, there was a proposal that making decisions must be based on emotions rather than intellect. Hence the new dating culture. If you study the Bible, if I were to have time, the Bible's way of getting married from the Hebrew society was mate selection. Families usually arrange marriages as we are going to study today. Uh, uh, every culture may have its way. In the New Testament, you notice in the Roman society, you have met selection usually arranged by families. Example, Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Be it as it may, there is a functional difficulty with our dating habit. Hence, I say, fixing flawed family foundations. All the young people are looking for they want the right spouse. They want the right man. They want the right woman. But the dating culture that is based on or the philosophical underpinning of romanticism is not helping do the right thing. And it leads to a lot of immorality. Let me give you an example. By 1950s, a new morality had arrived in the world. And with it came a jump from the ditch of uh, this foolishness to permissiveness. Then you see today, we see the resultant. Society flounts sex in everything. The effects are far-reaching. That a return to modesty would almost instantly collapse every economy of the world. Sports is run on sex. Entertainment is run on sex. Everything is around sex. If you want it to sell, you must polish it around sex. So sex sells. And the concept of sex we see today 
originated from the theory of romanticism which exalts emotion above logic, above reason. And today, sadly, the young people in, in the Christian church are susceptible to its bewitching influence. It is in this slide the Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, they should ask God. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Let me make a bold statement today. God owes it not a responsibility to direct you to the right spouse until you acknowledge him. Look at the text again. In all your ways, including your boyfriend's way, your girlfriend's way, acknowledge him. How will God direct your path? What's the condition? precedent to God directing your path you must acknowledge him not in many ways in all ways then you have given him the seat then he can direct your path finding the right spouse is very tough so yesterday we started a journey I want to do a recap and then dive straight yesterday we said step one in the process of finding a right spouse I've decided to go and, and, and look at it quite carefully. Genesis chapter 24, verse 1 to verse 2. So we agreed that Abraham was worried and concerned about Isaac's marriage and asked Eliezer to make a covenant and an oath. So yesterday we said, parents have a great role in the choice of spouses of their children. Yesterday, step number two, we said, the Bible says Abraham said, I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not get a wife for my spouse or for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living. But you will go to my country and go to my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. Yesterday we agree, choice of spouse cannot be from any spiritual locals. Genesis chapter 24, 3 to verse 4. So yesterday we said we need to ask the question, is he or she a believer? That leads me to point number three. Genesis chapter 24, verse 5 to verse 7. The Bible says, the servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country which you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's house and my native land, who spoke to me and promised me on oath, said to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angels before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. Yesterday we agreed that you need to commit your search work which is your courtship and dating to the God of heaven. It was at this end we ended yesterday. Our subject today, fixing, flawed, family foundation, subheading, traits of the right spouse. In the next slides, to slide a point, to point 21, I'm coming to run and give you some critical, practical example from God's word. Before we continue, let's again bow our heads. As we pray, Father in heaven, eternity is at stake for young people. Mentors, parents, fathers, mothers are also studying so that we know your will, so that we can guide and guard the next generation, so that a new generation and legacy will be formed. Christian young people can find practical guide in seeking for a spouse. And they are sure with this, they will not err. Please give me the right word and let your spirit be heavy on the hearts that God must work on today because it is someone's season of redemption and fixing a problem which is a generational problem. So shall it be. It is done in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 24, verse 8 to verse 9. Follow me very carefully. If the woman is unwilling to come back, 
with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the tie of his master, Abraham, and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Give it a thought. What lesson can we learn in getting married from this? The man says, don't marry from here. Get a wife for my son. And the man asks, what if the woman refused to come? Because at this stage, they do not know which woman. Abraham responded, Eliezer is a brilliant, brilliant servant. Asking the right question. He says, this is the rule of engagement. If the woman refused to come, you are released of this oath. Don't take my son there. On this, they made an oath. And the man knows his framework. The lesson there is this. Be certain on your deal breakers. Anytime you are about to get married, listen, Abraham says, Look, if the woman refused to come, let there be no marriage. Let there be no relationship. In other words, everyone preparing to get married, you need to know your deal breakers. Since when you see in a person, you agree with this, I am not going, no matter what somebody says. Be certain. If you do not know, it reminds me, of Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, the Bible says, and Daniel proposed in his heart that he will not eat the king's meat. Before a man shows up, before a woman shows up, be sure, be certain on your deal breakers. If this should show up, I am done. The relationship is not happening. Many young people enter relationships and they had no deal breakers or breaking variable. So they turn them this way, they turn. They turn them this way, they turn. They turn them this way, they turn. No, you make an error. Be sure of your deal breakers. If this should happen, this is not happening. Abraham said, if the woman is not willing to go, you are released from this oath of mine. Lesson number four, in fixing flawed family foundation, have or be certain on your deal breakers. Insight number five. Look at verse 10. So watch verse 1 through to verse 9. They know the deal breakers. They knew the area the woman must come from or where the woman will not come from. They committed the whole set to the God of heaven. Abraham was playing an active role as a parent. These were all preparations before you start looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. But in the part three, fixing flawed family foundation. Now from this part, after doing all the prayers and all this framework, this is where the problem begins. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out from Aram, Nahariam, and made his way to the town of Nahor. What is in this text for marriage couples or would be married couples? Ladies and gentlemen, after you have prayed, after you know the framework you want to operate, after you know your deal breakers, after you've committed your relationship issues to the God of heaven, this is what you need to know. Make a move. Somebody say, make a move. First, let me hear the young men and the old men and the married men and the unmarried men shout and say, make a move. No, that's a weak one. Come on, those online, just type, make a move. I repeat, scream and say, make a move. Yes, I like the bars or the bass coming from the man. Some men can't even propose to our daughters. Their mouth is dead or are dead. Only three things happen when you propose to a woman. She will say yes. She will say no. Or she will say give me time. Ah! 
the easiest thing to do is to propose to a woman. Let the men say an amen. amen. Some of you, you are faint-hearted. You are lazy. A man born in Africa, you see a beautiful lady and you don't walk and shake her and ask her a question and give her a manifesto and she cannot sleep overnight. You are afraid. Some of you are already thinking, the way this lady is looking, she's already dating. The way this lady is doing, listen, I repeat, me, if I was not married, married, there is no woman in the world that I cannot approach. Who are you? Who born dog? Who born dog? I see you. You fit the bill. Let me tell you. Saturday I told you. Let me do this well. Then the servant, after all this, took ten of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram, uh, Nahariam, and made his way to the town of Nahor. There is no more prayer. After praying and all this, you need to act. After all this week of prayer on family life, move to your church and the lady you have always been desiring, tell her now what is on your heart. The Holy Spirit will back you. Somebody say an amen there. What are you afraid of? When we were in the university, one of my friends came to me in the dawn. It was a Thursday. He came. My nickname, they call me only close allies. They call me Cyborg. He said, my guy, Cyborg, what's up? He said, I saw a lady. Hey, my guy, my system. Mm. I said, hey. So Saturday morning, we went to church. I went early with him. And the lady was coming and he said, yay. She's the one in the red. Watch. Dead seat. One, two, three. But don't turn. I said, okay, I won't turn. So I'm watching. Then they ask us to stand up. Opening him, him eight. We gather together. Immediately the organist said, pa, 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 pa. I've seen the lady. Mm -mm. Okay. So I profiled her. Tuesday, we had a corporate class. She was there. Immediately the class ended. I went to her. I said, hi, my name is Godswell. How are you doing? She said, I'm fine. She's from, she's from Rwanda. And I said, how is your week looking like? She said, please, may I know what? I said, no, we, want to, we just want to take a drink around them. I want to know you better. She said, really? I said, no, come on, nothing to fear. She said, she, said, I, she agreed, Thursday, noted. A week after the guy told me. I told my guy, you are eating on me. Don't think about the money. Now think about your manifesto. We went to give him rundown. <laughs> a whole letter. How can you fail as a son of Abraham? How can you not propose to a woman and she will be thinking the whole night? Why won't you rent an apartment in a woman's head? Eh? My guy went, eating the chicken and the drink. He was discussing Sabasco and quoting Ellen White. I was so disappointed. Quoting Ellen White. Somebody else, in a month's time, proposed to the girl. The girl was off. Now they are married. He nearly died. I said, die. <laughs> die. God cannot even help you. Die. Ladies and gentlemen, after all the prayer and everything we are saying, God will not come and propose to a woman for you. Please, may I speak to the sisters too? When you see a man you like, if your culture says you cannot tell your intentions, there are millions of ways to make it known. But I will not bother you, the sisters, too much. But ladies and gentlemen, the men hear me loud. If don't assume, don't assume. It's not every lady that is driving a car and nice and so saucy 
and beautiful that is dating. You are childish if you think that way. Ah! Be bold and tell your mind. Budget for it. Three things. Yes, no, or the third one is what I'm thinking about. We have gone to places. We took it as a contract. People said no for six months. We were developing framework. Finally, Goliath came down. What are you afraid of as a man? The Bible says, one way you may lose your would be spouse. God might have destined you. She is meant for you. He is meant for you. But your laziness, your laziness can cause a whole generation from benefiting. How weak-hearted can you be that you are afraid a woman will reject me? And to the ladies, listen to me. When a man proposes to you, it doesn't mean that he's immoral. Please, some of you, when they propose to you, then you go and tell this person, you tell that person, it's all over the place. So what childish behavior is that? Come on. But men, budget for it. They can do all they can. We'll pull them down. Budget for it. Make a move. He set out for Aram, Nahiram, after prayer, make your intentions known. If that is clear, somebody say an amen out there. Point number six. Look at it, verse number 11 to verse 12. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was towards evening, the time the women go out to draw water. This is a whole inspiration on how to propose, how to win a bid. Look at it. When did he get to the town? According to the text. When did he get to the town? It was when? Towards evening. And what time was that? Come on, what time was that? The time women go out to do all to draw water. When I say make a move, it doesn't mean you make move anyhow. We went to a friend's funeral and we went there on this weekend. And my friend went to propose to a lady whose funeral, we, the mother is dead. We went for the funeral. You, you went to propose to a woman. How can you propose to a woman during a funeral? The mother's funeral. And the lady came, God so, I am so broken. I said, what is it? How can? He told me he was coming. I am the commander in chief. You go behind me. You, the street is something. You need coaching. Funeral, you went to propose, they bounce him. I say, you deserve it. Ah, in this text, what I see is success in spouse selection is related also to prudent timing. So you need to check. You must be sensitive to the nuances. Don't propose to a woman after exams. The exam might have dealt with her. So she can bounce you. So don't propose after exams. You need to check the mood of the woman or the man. Whatever it is, it's a principle. Is she in a good mood? Is it a good time? Is it a good season? You need to check all your contours. You may have a good case, but you may lose your case. Why? Eliaza arrived towards evening. Who was he looking for? He was looking for women. That was his sample group or target group. So he went in the evening. It was time where women go to fetch water so that he can get a huge sample to select from. Be wise. Some of you, the ladies, don't keep staying in your church for life. Sometimes live new life. Go to Lavington. Go to somewhere else. Travel around. It's not only based in your village church. No way. It's not only in Kenya. Your husband may come from. I'm from Ghana. I got married to a woman in where? Sierra Leone. But you also need to know the timing. It was the timing. Point number seven. Our subject is fixing flawed family foundation. Point number seven. Look at verse 12. Then he prayed, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Point Number seven is the success or the sex success demand or demands a life of prayer. There should be constant prayer. 
So the man prayed, prayed before he left, got to the well. At the time women were fetching water, before he shot his, or he would shoot his shot, he prayed, dear God, grant me success today. Choosing a wife is a spiritual activity. Choosing a husband is a spiritual activity. Don't take it lightly. Look at point number eight. See, I am standing beside the spring. He's speaking to God. And the daughters of the town's people are coming out to draw water. He was using his brain at the right place at the right time. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have sworn or shown kindness, as you say, to my master. What is the principle there? In searching for a spouse, because you cannot be certainly sure, it is not out of place to ask God for a sign. Ask God for a sign. Do it from a genuine heart. Do it from a sincere heart. Do it with all honesty. Ask God. For a sign. Now, for the remainder of this session, we are going to look out for things to look out for in a prospective spouse. So, I've divided it into three parts. We dealt with that contour. So, before the journey, now, before he will make the request or make the proposal, there are things we also needed to put in place. Remember, we started from five, which says you need to make a move, make a move. Then we say number six. Don't just make a move. In making the move, you need to know the right timing. After you set out in the right timing, before you make your intentions known to a woman or a man, please tell the Lord, take charge. And number eight or number nine, you may ask number eight, you may ask God for a sign. That leads me to point number nine. Step nine in selecting the right spouse. Look at verse 15. Before he got finished praying, God is a prayer answering God. Before he had finished praying, heaven is interested in who you marry. God is not too far from answering speedily, immediately, instantly. It is possible before he got finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar. On her shoulder, she was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the text again. Before he had finished speak, uh, praying, Rebecca came out. If I was a certain preacher, I would say, may your will-be spouse come out during this season. Wherever he is, may God connect your path. Wherever she is, may God connect your path. We pray in the name of Jesus that this season, somebody may locate, may see their Rebecca or their Reuben in Jesus' name. Before he got finished praying, Rebecca came out. Who was Rebecca? What was she doing? Rebecca came out with her jar. Rebecca was not anywhere praying, give me a husband, give me a husband, give me a husband. I told you yesterday, she was doing her job. She came out with her jar, not a slay queen, on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel. Son of Milka, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. The inspiration is saying, this girl fit the description of Abraham. Now see the first thing the Bible said about Rebecca. What was the first thing? She was, I didn't hear it. She was, nobody should tell you, step number nine, look for physical beauty. 
don't go and take any cockroach which looks like a cockroach to you and say she she teaches sabbath school well it's not enough marriage we don't only teach sabbath school there is a physical bonding if she's not nice to you leave it the lady was very beautiful if he's not handsome for you put an asterisk don't marriage is not suicide ah! don't marry and be struggling this is the bible the bible says if you want to marry look out for someone who is attractive if that is clear somebody say an amen women don't let anybody guilt strip you just settle for anything settle for a handsome guy according to your de definition and similitude why Quote genesis 24 verse 16 the girl was very beautiful before her character hear me women before we know if you are you are brought up well what we see first as men is your beauty so take care of your hair but also take care of the head Keep your body glowing. Be clean. When you, you speak, no mouth order. We can't hold breath for the rest of our life in this marriage. Now kissing is a problem in the marriage. How? No. When you finish eating chicken and fish, please put a mint in your mouth brush your teeth smell nice smell good some of you the women your hair have too much uh, down draft or how do you call it man you give a hand mm, mm, no the bible says the girl was what very beautiful may god grant beautiful girls to our sons and may our daughters find no spider with a bow tie. May God grant them handsome husbands. The girl was very beautiful. If that is clear, somebody scream aloud, Amen. Amen. Those of you online, type beauty stroke handsomeness. If you can't spell handsomeness because you have a grammar difficulty, just write beauty. God will understand. Look for physical beauty. But may I warn you, it's also critical to ask, what is the content of your beauty gun? Are you getting it? The beautiful can you are seeing, the content is equally relevant some of the packaging they are scams so beyond the beauty you ask the question what is in the beauty can this body that is so attractive after a while when the man knows or the woman knows you are just handsome you work out you look good nice but you are foolish foolish things must be thrown out so as you take care of the body the beauty can ask also for the content. That leads me to point number 10. Genesis 24, verse 13 to verse 14. What does the Bible say? The Bible talked about this girl. Look at it again. The girl was very beautiful. After the beauty, what, what is the next thing the Bible brings to us? She was a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. The principle there is, as you look for beauty, look also for moral purity. And let the men hear me. Let, me. let me speak first to the men. Whenever we talk about moral purity, we think it is a woman's responsibility to be chaste. You are mad. You are mad. A man is a spiritual head. Tomorrow I'm going to deal with that. If there should be any group that should take purity and morality serious, is the head of the family the head of the nation i speak to men across the world myself inclusive you cannot demand moral purity when you are morally impure and impure the bible says when you see rebecca the first thing you see 
beautiful. The next thing you see, morally solid. Many men are asking the girls and the women to be physically beautiful, yes, but don't be morally, be morally beautiful or pure. But as for us, you know this is how men are. Say so. The standard for moral purity for a man is more required than a woman. A man is a spiritual head. The girl was very beautiful. A virgin. No man had ever lain with her. May I state, we make mistakes and sin in life. There are some virgins, they are, they are worse than converted prostitutes or active prostitutes. Some people are dirty virgins. They've not had penetrative sex, but they masturbate to death. It's constant. You are unpure, and it's a matter of time. Masturbating can give you stroke. It can lead you not to enjoy your sexual life when you get married. And all this nonsense about dildos and all its bewitching influence. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says, aside beauty, God said, Rebecca was morally pure. So if you are dating, you want to date, when he's nice, the next thing you look out for, what is his moral character? Please, don't take it for granted. The girls, hear me. Whatever a man would do during your dating time, he's going to do 10 times when you are married. So when he's morally impure, 20%, expect 200% of moral impurity when you marry him. Demand it. Demand it. And let me state it again. Any man who sleeps with a woman before he marries her, in his mind, another man can sleep with that woman. The man will not tell you. It's the brother's code. So, you are dating and he's sleeping with you. Guess what? He will never trust you when he's not around. He will not just say it. But in his mind, you are not correct. And to the men, the women don't trust us either. This is the reason why they have insecurity issues. God has made marriage not to be so cumbersome. If we follow his principle, look for beauty. But after looking for beauty, look for what? Moral purity. Please, moral purity includes Kissing, licking, all forms of impure acts. Hear me loud and hear me clear. God is not a man. We cannot manipulate God. Do you want God to guide you to find your spouse? Do you want God to guide you to find the right woman and the right man? If yes, listen to him. Surrendering to God, like yesterday we talked about, means I will follow what he's saying. In the days of ignorance, that's why I said this Saturday, there'll be baptism. Act says, God hath winked at. Now he has called men everywhere that they should repent. The past may be gone, beginning this week, beginning today. You tell yourself, I am on a journey of moral purity. If that is clear, somebody say an amen out there. That leads me to step number 11. Genesis 24, 15 to verse 16. Look at the text very carefully. The girl was very beautiful. The first trait, beauty, physical attraction. Two, a virgin, moral compass. No man had ever lain with her. Three, she went down to the spring, filled her jar. And came up again. So see, see what God is saying. If you want to marry, look for physical beauty. God says you need it. Number two, look for moral compass. You need it. The next thing you need is work ethics. Look for diligence in work. Another way to say it is work ethics. 
if you are in school and the young man will always come to class to copy people's work, don't marry him. You'll be a thief, very lazy. These days, the men, they don't want to work. Go to the universities. The first class students, women, men are falling down, 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 down. You cannot be lazy as a man. Everybody who believes the Sabbath, six days you shall work and do all your labor. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Anybody who believes in the Sabbath must be productive. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Work hard. You cannot enjoy the Sabbath if you are lazy. Lazy on WhatsApp. Lazy on TikTok. Lazy on X. Lazy on Facebook. Please, work. 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 Don't be lazy. Any woman who marries a lazy man, you do it to your peril. And don't let any man dim your lights. A man is lazy. He is not working. He is not progressing. And he's demanding the woman must come to my level. She, he is not your type. Guys, let's elevate the journey. Look, it may take time for we to get money. But one thing should be clear. Let a woman declare he's not a lazy man. That is enough. And some women are very lazy. They want to live soft life. They behave like charged electrons. They know all the good things in life. The only problem is they don't know how to get it. Listen, success is not sexually transmitted. Success is not sexually transmitted. If you want to marry, look for someone who is diligent at work. Please, did I say he must be rich? Did I say that? What did I say? The Bible in God in his wisdom said, look at Rebecca, physically beautiful, morally mine, and work ethics. Very hard working girl. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, came up again, repeating the process, producing, reproducing, producing, reproducing. Work ethics. Check it out. He may not be the best student, but one thing you know, he may be slow student, he may be a C student, but this guy, he studies. This guy, submit assignment on time. This guy, listen, they are indicators. Watch out. In case you are forgetting, all what you are watching out for, you must be, you must be it yourself. Let me say it again. All you are watching out for, you must be it yourself. You can't be lazy and looking for a hardworking man. You'll be unequally yoked. You can't be immoral and be looking for pure people and equally yoke. Don't kill somebody's daughter or somebody's son. Our subject today, fixing flawed family foundations. Subheading, traits of the right spouse. Step number 12, watch it carefully, verse 17. The servant hurried to meet her and said, please give me how, how much water? Come talk to me. Give me how much water? A little water from your jar. Do you know what gave Rebecca a husband? A little water. Look at it very carefully. What did she say? Let's read it together. Verse 18. Let's read it together. She says, well, drink, my Lord. She said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. He traveled about 500 miles. There was no quarter. He was dusty. He was dirty. He was, he was dust buffed. Stranger. This was her character. Rush to this girl. Please give me water. She didn't behave like Ghanaian girls or Kenyan girls. They will watch you up and down and throw their eyes. Then you know your level. The next lesson is Ketsy, look out for Ketsy. Look, 
look at this girl. Can I get the water to drink? I'm testing. She says, oh, sir, please have water. Can I get water to drink? No. I was going for a naming ceremony one Sunday morning. My phone was off. So I lost the Google direction thing. And I saw a nice girl. And I was honking. Then I rolled down the glass and I asked, please, madam, sister. She watched me like this and she left. You know, she thinks I have a sickness. She's my solution. But I have no sickness. I'm taking care of well. We went to the baby's naming ceremony and I saw her appearing. I'm the preacher. Oh my God. If it was Nigerian film, it would sound or Ghanaian film. Bah, 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 bah. Then I asked the couple, who is she? He said, oh, the man said, it's my brother's girlfriend. Good. I call him. Don't marry her. It didn't work. She was rude. She was disrespectful. She was, she was the epitome of disrespect. Hear me. They asked Rebecca a little water. You know what may give you your destined husband, a little curtsy, a little good morning, a little sir, a little please, a little patience, a little carefulness. You do not know who you are in a public vehicle with. You do not know who you are in that meeting with. You just do not know. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a woman cannot fall. You know, when boys call, ladies will be coming. Then a lady will slip and fall. And guys are screaming. They are laughing. No way. I told Susan. I told her. I'm sure Susan is watching. Susan, I told you. Any man who laughs at you and tease you, join others to tease you. Don't be his friend. Ketsy. Sometimes the way we talk to women, the guys, is so rude and disrespectful. And some of you, the ladies, listen, please, your money, go to your house with it. Please, don't bring it here. Don't bring it here. For the fact that you are a boss and you are in a workplace and you command men, keep it there. Don't bring it to us here. Some of you, the way you are carrying yourself, it will take you years. What level of arrogance is this? It's against the very Christian ethos. The Bible says, the next thing God says, Rebecca qualifies to become the grandmother of Jesus. She was courteous. Courteous in little things. Little things. Little things. Little things. You are on the road. And then, just a little care. A little, a little, a little decency. A little curtsy. Look out for curtsy. When a man is not courteous to you today, when you marry him, he will never be courteous to you. When a woman is disrespectful to you today, she will be disrespectful times six million. Be careful. Look out for curtsy. I repeat, everything you are looking out for, you yourself must well be. The thirteenth point. Watch it carefully. Verse 19. After she had given him a dream, she said, this was her initiative, I will draw water for your camels too until they have finished drinking. Wow. She was not asked. She chose. This is a Christian. This is a woman. This is a man worth marrying. What I see there is Consider the character of extra mile. Extra mile. She, they just ask for a little water. And you know this, the permutation. Ten camels, plus or minus. 
the liters of water she was going to, uh, these camels are going to drink. Camels are mean. They are stupid. When they are to laugh, they frown. When they are to frown, they laugh. They, water is their fuel. They travel about 500 miles or kilometers, and they have come huh, from Canaan down. So they were thirsty. They drank 10 camels. She says, I will draw water for your camels until they are done. It will not take minutes. It will take her hours, hours, hours. But she elated to do it herself. When you want to say yes to a man, watch out. Does he have any trait of an extra mile? An extra mile may mean, I need five, 50, five, 500 shillings data, and he sends 600. Can I get Mpensa transfer for this? And he's considerate that they will take charges, so he adds some. This, they are basic things you watch out for, for extra mile. Please. The Christian must be the best husband and the best wife. All we are talking about, we are not talking money. We are not talking properties yet. Basic principle. If a man is having this, and let me talk to the old men and women. Some of you don't want your sons to be married to some individuals because they don't have money. And those of you watching online, some of you the men, some of you the women, because of your family standing, you feel you profile people. And say this one is not good they don't have money you think life is all about money my mother-in-law mrs vandy when i was going to marry samuela i asked her in private what are you looking for in a son-in-law remember i was 26 years she looked at me and smiled and said i need three things i need a godly man i need a man who knows how to work hard but also know how to work smart with this i'm done she never mentioned money. She's looking for some ideal. Listen, money will finish. But if the person has certain moral standing, I'm not just talking about spirituality. I'm talking about work ethics. Are you getting the point? Money can, look, you can lose all your money. But if you have these characteristics, you can rebuild and become all the best you possibly can be. I want to hear an amen in this regard. Amen. Look out for the character of the extra mile. Watch it. So she quickly emptied a jar into the trowel, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. I don't want to talk about her agility. She was not working sluggishly. She was not working as if she's doing anybody a favor. She was doing it from the depth of her heart. This is a wife. No wonder God chose her. To be the grandmother of Jesus. Look for a heart. Look at it. She ran back, drew more water, drew enough for all his camels. I say, the man you want to marry or the woman must have a heart of service even for outcasts. Outcasts. If this girl can be sensitive to animals, not just animals, this is not a pet. It's a camel. A camel. They smell. They are weird. Their teeth are brown. Camels are not. Ah! Take a camel to me. A car tie. Traveling on the road. All the dust will be in its belly. No. But this girl was thinking of a camel. If a girl can think of a camel, she can think of the mother-in-law. If a boy can think of a camel, a man can think of a camel, he will think about the father-in-law. Please, the old men and women, when your daughters are making choices, watch out. Watch out for what inspiration has stated. These are indicators. Lesson number 15. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. This is a critical point. Hear me. When you now find the dream man, and you now see that dream lady, 
You now feel he is the one. She is the one. What is the, your attitude when you are getting it right? Closely analyze development. Do it in silence. Some of you, we check your status. We just know who are your boyfriends. You are all over the place. Hey, keep quiet. Don't post on social media. What do you do without saying a word? I should have highlighted that. Without saying a word, the man watch closely. Watch her closely to learn. Has God indeed answered my prayer? So when he's doing all the right things, my boo, my boo. Listen, then the relationship ten beats. In West Africa, we say it ten beans. The thing has gotten out of hand. You are broken up. Then the whole world is aware. Then the first, the second, the third, the fourth. Was for her. Oh, she, she dated this one. Oh, she dated. You are stupid. Please, next time. When you are dating, it is going well. Sir, closely analyze development. Don't go about talking. Learn from El Eliezer. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely. Our subject for this moment, fixing flawed family foundation. These principles, when we pick them up, you can be sure the next generation will be better than our generation. Look at this one. Verse 22. And this one is going to get a little tough and controversial. God, give me the wisdom to say it nicely. Read it with me. Let's read it together. Let's go. So it was, when the camels had finished drinking, that the man took a golden nose ring, weighing half a shekel, and two bracelets for her wrist, weighing ten shekels of gold. I can explain the theological underpinning. It was a cultural norm. But this, was, this is the principle. When did the man give the girl a gift? When did he... Come on. When did he give the, the girl a gift? After what? The camels had what? Finished drinking. The man took a golden nose ring, weighing half a shekel, and two bracelets for her wrist, weighing ten shekels of gold. The principle I learned there is scout for an attitude of gratitude and generosity. Don't marry any man that is close-fisted. They don't give. They don't give. Some women, they only receive, give me, give me, give me. Some girls are dating guys, they have never given gifts. You will just know them. They only know how to receive. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Some men, they will never give shamelessly. A full grown man, always receiving from your girlfriend. Don't you have shame? It's not just giving. Look at it. I used two words. I said, the Bible says, so it was when the camels had finished drinking. And this is an act of gratitude. He was saying, what? In 2024? In Nairobi? In Africa? In the world today? A girl can do this? Please. Please. This is a token. Please. Any time you are dating, don't date somebody who is close-fisted. If he is not going, listen, if you are dating him, I'm not saying plenty money. I'm coming to calculate how much what he gave is worth. But it's a principle. Give, just give. Me, when I was dating Samuela, she came to Ghana 2009 or 2008. I noticed my then girlfriend was not having a laptop. Her friends were all over the place. But she was quite content with life. So I watched her when she was leaving. I was 24. I bought a brand new laptop. She didn't ask. I bought her pen drives, things necessary for her to make her university work easier. 
so that no minister, the ministers were competing with me. They, they were big guys with deep pockets. The guys I'm just preaching, the guys have too much cash. Ah. I took her for shopping. She left Ghana with one thing in mind. This guy is a good guy. You are too close-fisted. Ah! Give. Sir, give. Ooh. It's a shame. Give. It must not be plenty, but give. When you are coming back from some point, just give. No, you only receive. No. Listen. What did he give? Took a golden nose ring. Let me go back. The man took a golden nose ring, weighing half a shekel. Take note of that. And two bracelets for her wrist, weighing ten shekels of gold. This doesn't mean ornamental jewelry is, no, this is a cultural thing. And I can break it. And remember, these were not the covenant people. But Abraham Seven did research and knew that this is the culture of my master's place. So he was ready. This has nothing to do with that issue. Let me just give a disclaimer. Now, 50 shekels of gold is equivalent to 0 0.5 kilograms of gold today. Follow me. One kilogram of gold today sells at $65,622. So by extension, half a kilo of gold today is $32,811. Follow me. Watch the text. A golden nose ring weighing half a shekel. So let's go back. 50 shekel of gold is 0 0.5 kilogram of gold. So one kilogram of gold today, we saw it. So 0 0.5 kilogram of gold today is selling at 32,811 US dollars. Now, 10 shekels of gold is one fifth of 50 shekels of gold. You need to use your brain to get it. So 32,811 thousand dollars. Twenty one feet is twenty percent. So twenty percent of that is six thousand five hundred twenty six dollars. So the ten shekels of gold that they gave the girl in today's term is six thousand five hundred twenty six US dollars. A gift first day they met. This is what the the big boys are competing with and you can't even buy you can't even buy apple 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 or orange how can you survive in this market ah, you can't even buy apple why one shekel of gold is 652 kilograms uh, US dollars so half a shekel of gold is 218 dollars 74 cent so the total gift Eliaza gave Rebecca was 6,526 plus 218 dollars, which is 6,744 US dollars. If you are in Kenya, you multiply it by 149, 145, or 150, then you get a shilling equivalent. Ladies and gentlemen, he was not cheap. He came expensive. We may not have this today because if you finish graduate school, you are not working. You can't afford this. But the principle is, be a man or a woman after you have been given your camels are finished drinking show appreciation be a woman who is a gratitude centered woman a generous guy don't just gloss over goodness of others when somebody is doing something mention it boldly show gratitude any ingrate should not become your husband or your wife. I repeat, any woman who would demonstrate ingratitude, don't put an asteric mark. And the question is, you yourself, are you that? I'm about wrapping it up. Look at verse number 22. Verse Number 23, I should say. After all this, the man asked the girl, Whose daughter are you? Tell 
tell me, please, is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? My interest is in the first question. When you are dating a guy or you want to date a girl, you want to court a guy, you want to form a relationship, don't go every night you are on the phone. Nancy, I love you. James, I am dying for you. Nancy, I can't sleep because of you. James, you will kill me. Nancy, every day, you are not asking relevant questions. The man asks, whose daughter are you? The meaning is, ask him or her needful and thoughtful question. Example, which type of women excite you? Please, stop the pretense. Let's be real. Do you like slim girls? Do you like girls with body? You tell me, what made you not married at this time? What broke up your previous relationships? You will be drawing some parallels. But you see, you gloss over it. It's just about, let's go and take chicken. Let's do this. Let's have some fun. Foolishness. Ask needful question. I'll be in counseling and some ladies will come. How old is your boyfriend? Two years. She's telling me, maybe around. I said, get out. I said, get out. Get out. How can you tell me two years? Now you are coming to cry. How old is your boyfriend? Uh, uh, maybe about uh, hey. two years. You date a man, you don't know his age. Come on, get out. What were you doing throughout the two years? Question How many siblings is your boyfriend having? You don't know. Are you mad? So, what do you talk about? Are we in love? You need to ask. Ask needful question. If you were to be married, how many kids would you like to have? And why? At what age will we wish that we get married? Talk about career and finances. What is his philosophy about money? What is his philosophy? Ask question. When we are married... I am telling you, you need to enroll for a master class. I'm damn serious. When we are doing the, I, there are some 22 questions, the questionnaire, over about 200 questions. When you finish analyzing it, some of you go and show red card to your boyfriends. This guy is a chaff. This boy, this girl, useless. Ask a needful question. Roles in the marriage. When you are married, what are the roles? What am I expecting from a man? What is his framework about a working wife? You need to know. So when dating or about to date, ask relevant question. You need to know the size of the decision you are about to make. I feel like screaming. If we don't do this, we can't fix the flawed family foundations. Two more to go. She answered him and said, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milka bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty straw and folder as well and room for you to spend the night. She was again thinking about the camels. Then the man bowed down and worshipped. The Lord saying, praise be to the Lord, the God of my master Abraham who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, listen to him. The Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the principle in the 18th step is prayer should characterize every progress. The man is progressing and he kept praying. 19, then what happened? The girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. What has happened? They give you $6,500 and all this. You keep it to yourself. Listen, when you are dating somebody or you are looking, look out for his or her confidentiality barometer. There are things she needs not to tell anybody. There are things she must tell the parent. So you now need to ask, who is she talking to? She told the whole family. Listen, I met a man. He was good to me. This was what happened. This was what happened. Here is what she brought. If you are a boyfriend and your girlfriend is not or has not hinted the parents about you 
you're on probation. If he can't tell his relatives about you, myself and her, we are starting to see if we could marry each other. It's a, listen, you need to know. Look out for his or her confidentiality barometer. Then the, the 20th point I want to pull to you today is, now Rebecca had a brother named Laban, and he hurried to the man at the spring. Look out for family interests. Watch out. Is the family interested in you? We went to a place with a friend and we were eating and drinking fufu soup. My friend was eating too much now. He finished and he asked for more. Then I was scanning because I told him, don't go there alone. We need to go so that we'll, we'll, we'll test the pulse. You know, when you are so madly in love, you don't think, you are stupid. So we, we are not stupid, we will put our thinking caps on so that we can pick signals for you. The guy was just eating and talking plenty. And the sisters-in-law, they stood at the gate like this and they shook their head and they were doing like this. In Ghana, when they do that, it means, oh, which in-law is this? No shame. See the way he's eating. You've not given money for them to cook. Get see. And you are eating as if you are the landlord. No. Watch out for family interests. If the mother knows you are dating, do they check up on you once a while? Do they look out for you? You are the lady. Now your boyfriend has told the parent about you. Do they even care about your well-being? Don't take it for granted. Watch out all these. When this was done, they finally got married. Was there any special benefit? Chap verse 67 of chapter 24. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah. It's a cultural issue again. Don't go and take your wife and take to your mother's room. And he married Rebecca. So she became his wife. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Oh, marriage is not bad, young people. Please, it's possible to love somebody. And guess what? When life hits you hard, they are the ones that are going to be the shield and comfort during life's storms. Isaac loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Sarah's death did not shock Isaac. Why? Rebecca was in his life. I don't want to deliver the point. But allow me to ask some few questions. Ladies, we will analyze this deeper, but we can't do it. Look, every man who wants to marry or who is already married, Answer the following questions. Number one, will I study her reaction to know who is a good man? You need to project. Will I study her reaction? A man must ask himself, physically, mentally, and emotionally, and encourage her to confine her hopes and dreams to me. Are you capable that a woman can look at you and tell you, these are my inspiration. You have created a platform you, the girl is so confident to tell you a lot of stars. Number two, will I always demonstrate my affection, not expecting her to take my love for granted? There is a way a man must carry himself. And you can be jovial, but nobody can take it for granted. You can't disrespect me. I will finish you. I'm sorry. I will laugh, will joke, but you must build a personality in a way, the way you carry yourself, jovial, very social, but nobody can take your love. And your personality for granted men must ask themselves this question will i try to see things from her perspective as well as my own to avoid becoming set in my ways it's either my way or no other way that is especially a choleric individuals no like tk means no calm down she's a human being with a head listen to her too can i lead interesting discussions of important issues without it ending in an argument. A man must develop the capacity to do this. 
If we do have a misunderstanding or a peevish outburst of irritation, will I put it behind us, settling the difficulty one way or the other? Or will I sock upon inviting the problems to return? Always guilt stripping. No. No. That is a road, a red flag or a red story building. Will I make allowances for irritability brought about through overtiredness and a build up of little house annoyances, pretending not to notice it? Like I told you, your daughter will pour the soup down and you are in and she's giving you attitude. No, you need to know that something is wrong somewhere. Can you handle this without it turning into a fight again? Will I inspire her and take an interest in her hobbies and in her more ambitions, ambitious ventures that are necessary for her happiness? Some men are threatened by the advances and the progress of a woman. God created her with a star, with a, with, 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 with a certain unique impact she must make in the world. Don't become an enemy. And because of your weak personality, you want to rob her down and dim her life. Allow her. You may have a first degree, she may have a PhD, but she must respect. There is a way to handle it, and it can be fine. Don't, will you be that husband to our daughters? Will I take an interest in her clothes? Show her my appreciation and pay her the little compliments and the attention that I did in our courting days. All the men are telling her the nice things, and only you, they must beg and make an altar call. Before you say for once, this attire is nice. Which man are you? Will her life be enriched? Her interest broaden? And her happiness and general well-being increased by marrying me? Can this lady you want to date or marry, can she become better just by marrying you? Number 10 for the men, the last one. Will I keep loving her? As the years roll by and changes of childbirth become glaring and age having its toll on her. She used to have a flat tummy. Project after four or five kids or three. When the breast is now dropping, the stomach is now different. Sir, will you still love this girl that is looking like a rose flower today? Let me ask the women their question and we bring it to a close. To any woman who is here or will be wife, hear and answer the following. Will I help him to achieve a fuller life by constantly endeavoring to broaden our horizon? Don't become a Jezebel because you are a wife. Will you marry this man, make him a better person? Will I use tact and sympathy with his little personal problems and help him understand himself? Your husband has 25% weaknesses and you have, you have succeeded in making him look like he's the worst man in the world. Nothing good can come out of him. No. Will I use tact sympathy with his little personal problems and help him understand himself men have ego you need wisdom to deal with a man with a double ego that is not converted number three will i study him and get a clear idea of all the little things that make him happy and confident some women you have you have you have broken the confidence span of your husband and some of you, the girls, the way you handle yourself, because of your cheap one, two by four IQ, you think you're on top of the world. You run every man down. You speak every man down. The question is, if you want to marry this man, you need to answer the question as a woman. If I marry him, can I study my boyfriend? Can I study my husband and have a full idea who he is? What makes him happy? What makes him confident? Every time we are done eating, Samola will tell you, Thank you for providing. Thank you for paying the school fees. Thank you for doing this. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies, please. Every time 
Now it must be the men that must be bashed. Some of you, you are just Jezebels. You kill the men and they have no confidence in them. Are you one? Will I share with him my little joys and successes and let him realize how much he contributes to my happiness? All it may take is to be talking to a friend and tell them, look, if not because of my husband, I will not be where I am today. You are telling him indirectly. And he's saying, he appreciates who I am, what I'm contributing. Will I overlook little irritabilities due to overwork and fatigue, pretending not to notice them, making allowances for the strain that the workplace can be and the responsibility of a family life can bring. Sometimes the men come and they are just tired. Those of you who will be getting married, he will just be angry. Listen. Sometimes you just ignore them. Johnson, or God's will, please, I'm going to take a shower, please. The food is on the table. I've set it up. Just let me know. All right. You don't want to go into any banter, so you are wise. Will I see that he has enough time for relaxation and quiet thought? Sometimes the women, the attention you need is like you are now trying to say you are the God of the man. Everything is not about you. Before you, he was once living. Even the woman who gave birth to him is not asking so much like you. Please, can you give him space? He's also a human being. Sometimes, listen, the men don't want any sex. Or they don't want anything. They just want to be there. They want to have a peace of mind. Take away your thing. He wants to sleep and think. He's having difficulty. So can't you notice me? Hey, you, they will kick you out. Give him some time to be on his own. When my feelings are aroused and out of proportion, you are angry due to misunderstanding. Will I always try to better understand him, our mutual relationship, and myself suspending harsh judgment with thoughtful self-inquiry? Women, use your brains. Sometimes you look at the thing and answer yourself and don't even ask a question. Have I noticed any mannerism in myself that may be irritating to him? There are things you do that get him so angry. They are like his, how do they call them? I've forgotten the technical word. Triggers. You do this and he's like a madman. Will you use your brain and know those triggers? Number nine. Will I let him enjoy women's company without undue suspicion? I covered it. And jealousy. Encouraging him to be sociable and helping him to, to find natural or to have fun and, and, and be at ease. But this is not for every, every man. For men, you allow them, you have eternal side chicks on your head. So you need to watch out on that one. A caution. After all, I have a daughter. So caution. But listen. Sometimes the men just want to be themselves. For the father, he's talking to a young lady. Doesn't mean they have anything in common. Please. Will I allow him have an evening off sometime and not rely on or demand constant companionship? Ghana was playing soccer 2010 before we married. Just 30 days for us to marry, or three weeks. Ghana was going to play a game. It was a Wednesday. I love to watch soccer if it's not on the Sabbath. Then Samola came. We are not married, though. Choose between the Ghana match or me. Pastor, I look at my then girlfriend and say, I've chosen Ghana. I can be mean. I've chosen Ghana. From that day, she has learned her lesson. If I'm going to watch soccer with the boys' boys, I recall one day, Susan was a girl, tiny girl, I think less than two years. We carried her. Midnight, there was a boxing match. My wife followed me. 2 a.m., we went to watch together. She just want to be in your company. I told you yesterday, I've got my, my area covered. You know. So sometimes the men just want to be alone. Lastly, women, ask yourself, will I cherish love and remain faithful to him? in case he gets bowed and physically challenged. 
if his stomach is now like eight-month pregnancy, and he's all like a round football, will you still love him? This evening, I'm not making an altar call, but I just want to pray a prayer. But I'm tempted to say, somebody should look at this. If you are dating, answer the following. In my current love relationship, we are mostly idle. We are dating and courting without a focus. Looks is only the glue. His or her talent is what is keeping us. His or her financial stability is what is keeping me there. Tick as many as apply. In my current love relationship, I feel depressed. I get angry or jealous. I am there because I am growing old. I am there because people will not take me serious if this relationship also fails. Question three. In my current love relationship, we are always quarreling. We are constantly dishonoring, it's a bit continuous, the law. We are cohabiting. We are not married but staying together. We are discovering the purpose of our existence. Which phase of what is happening in your current relationship? In my relationship, I wish no one will ever discover that I, I got this concept from Pastor Balisa, sir. In my current relationship, I wish no one will ever discover that I, what is it? about your current relationship that you wish no one will ever discover. In my relationship, I know Jesus dislike mine. What is it about your relationship that the Lord Jesus dislikes? If Jesus really wants to change something in my relationship, I would want him to start with, what is the first thing you wish Jesus would change about your marriage or your relationship? And after that first one, what things will follow? Lastly, may God forbid, but if I happen to miss heaven because of my relationship, it will mostly be due to my... I close with the story of the man by name, Hudson Taylor. The life of this guy teaches the value that God must guide who marries you or you marry. Taylor was an English missionary who died in 1910 after spending more than 50 years as a missionary in China. When he went there in 1854, nearly 380 million people in the country's vast interior had never seen a Westerner nor heard the name of Jesus. But with Taylor, by the time Taylor was leaving China, 205 preaching stations were established. 849 missionaries were installed. 125,000 Chinese had surrendered their lives to Jesus. He wielded such a spiritual power. Even today, the ripple effect of the life of Gutson Taylor cannot be told. He made an impact. But there was a tiny story that was recorded about Taylor. 
that when Taylor was leaving England, Taylor left behind his unfinished medical studies to be a missionary. And he had a girlfriend he wanted to marry at that time. And he told the girlfriend, will you follow me to China? God has called me for a job in China. She said, I will not go. Taylor was in China. God tested Taylor when he made him choose between God's will and his own desires. The day came in Taylor's life when he got to decide if it was important to be in God's will or just to be married. The choice was God's choice or a good choice. The girl in England was a good girl, nice girl, intelligent girl, but it doesn't mean she was God's choice. I submit to you today, in the choice of who you marry, don't choose a good husband, a good wife. It must be God's choice. Every choice from God will be good, but not every good man is God's choice for your life. I repeat, choose God's choice. It is better than a good choice. He may be a banker. He may be a politician. He may be a lecturer. He may be a decent girl. She may be a, an engineer. She may be a fashion designer. A good girl. But the question is, is she God's choice? This evening, anybody here who wants to say, I want God's choice, not a good choice, just raise your hand. Nobody's coming here. Just raise your hand. Those online, I want a good man, but I want him to be God's choice. I want a good woman, but God's choice. Just type, God's choice, not a good person. Just type, God's choice. All heads bow. Father in heaven, tonight, it's been a long journey. How I pray it will stay with us forever. We want to fix the flaw, family, foundations. We pray for every young man, every young woman who is in quagmire, who is in a state of contemplation and in their desert sun, not knowing who to choose, not knowing how to choose today through your word. You've given us guidelines, principles, and variables to consider. I pray today, may the records read after today, a new generation of Africans, of believers, of Christians, yea, of Muslims and agnostics, pick up this Bible principle and they will never make a mistake again in their choice of spouse. May the failures of our forebearers not be the portion of this generation. May God guide our daughters. May God lead our sons. May God direct our sisters. May God be the, the champion over the decisions of our brothers. May nobody be entertained, enticed, deceived by the devil to marry merely a good person and not God's choice. So I say today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the God of heaven lift up his face upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God cause you to meet the right person sooner than later. It is done because we have asked in Jesus' name.